The Kingdom of Kandy was an independent monarchy of the island of Sri Lanka, located in the central and eastern portion of the island. It was founded in the late 15th century and endured until the early 19th century. Initially a client kingdom of the Kingdom of Kote, Kandy gradually established itself as an independent force during the tumultuous 16th and 17th centuries, allying at various times with the Jaffna Kingdom, the Madurai Nayak dynasty of South India, Sitawaka Kingdom, and the Dutch colonizers to ensure its survival. From the 1590s, it was the sole independent native polity on the island of Sri Lanka and through a combination of hit and run tactics and diplomacy kept European colonial forces at bay, before finally succumbing to British colonial rule in 1818. The kingdom was absorbed into the British Empire as a protectorate following the Candian Convention of 1815, and definitively lost its autonomy following the Uva Rebellion of 1817. Name Over the years, the Kingdom of Kandy has been known by many names. These include Kanda Uda Pasrata, the Senkatagala Kingdom, the Kanda Uttarata, the Mahanuwara Kingdom, Sri Wardhanapura, Sinhalay, Toon Sinhalaya or Tri Sinhala, Kandy Nuwara, the Kingdom of Kandy. Geography and climate Much of the Kandy Kingdom's territory was located in Sri Lanka's mountainous and thickly forested interior, with mountain passes to the capital providing plenty of opportunities for defenders to stage ambushes. Routes to the city were kept secret, and spreading information concerning them could often result in death. Many routes into the hill country became impassable during the annual monsoon, and malaria was rife. Throughout its existence Kandyan forces used the land to their advantage, engaging in guerrilla warfare against invading forces, and evacuating major urban centers when enemy forces drew near, a tactic used with particular effect during the Kandyan Wars. Though the kingdom had intermittent access to the port of Batikaloa it had no naval forces and could not prevent the Portuguese and Dutch maintaining a strong presence in lowland areas. History Topic <inaudible> <inaudible> Foundation The city of Senkatagalapura may have been founded as early as the mid 14th century during the reign of Vikramabahu III of Gampola 1357 to 1374 Central Sri Lanka was ruled by the kings of Kote from the early 15th to late 16th centuries, with Kote's weakening in the face of Portuguese influence the area developed into an autonomous domain with Senkatagalapura at its capital. Following the spoiling of Vijayabahu in 1521, and the subsequent partition of the Kingdom of Kote, Kandy asserted its independence and emerged as a serious rival to the eastern and southern kingdoms. Topic: Rise, 1521 to 1594. Following the spoiling of Vijayabahu in 1521, the Kingdom of Kote split into three competing states: Sithawaka, Regama, and Bhuvanekabahu VII's Kingdom of Kote. Of these, Sithawaka, under the dynamic leadership of Mayadun, posed the greatest threat to the autonomy of the other states. In 1522, the Kandians secured Portuguese protection against Scythawaka, but any potential for alliance ended in 1546 when Portuguese and Kote forces invaded the kingdom. Kandy subsequently lent aid to the Jaffna kingdom against the Portuguese in 1560. Kandy territory was invaded twice in the 1570s and 1580s, first in 1574, and then in 1581 by the newly crowned king of Scythawaka Rajasing I Rajasing, who had already scored a significant victory over the Portuguese at the Battle of Mullariyawa, succeeded in annexing the kingdom outright. The Kandian king Karalayad Kumara Bandera also known as Jayavira III fled north to the Jaffna kingdom with his daughter, Kusumasana Devi also known as Dona Katharina of Kandy and her husband Yama Missing Bandera. Both eventually adopted Portuguese worship, converted to Christianity, and adopted the names Dona Catharina and Don Filipe respectively. 
In the meanwhile the Portuguese also laid claim to the Candian realm, citing Dharmapala's donation of 1580 as a precedent Scythawakan rule over Kandy proved difficult to enforce. Warasundara Mudiance, Rajasinghe's viceroy in the area, rebelled soon after the initial conquest, though his uprising was crushed another occurred in 1588. Resistance eventually coalesced around Kanapu Bandera, son of Warasundara, who had fled to Portuguese lands following his father's murder by agents of Rajasinghe. Between 1591 and 1594, he returned to the area, seized the Candian throne under the name Wimaladharmasuriya I and married Dona Katharina. Victories over the Scythawakans and the Portuguese, who occupied Kandy briefly in 1592, secured his position. The strategic situation in Sri Lanka changed dramatically during Wimaladharmasuriya's rise to power. To the north, the Portuguese deposed the King Paviraja Pandaram of the Jaffna Kingdom in 1591 and installed his son Ethirimana Singham as client king. In 1594, Rajasinghe I died and the kingdom of Scythawaka disintegrated. Kandy remained the sole native polity outside of European dominance. In 1595, Wimaladharmasuriya brought the sacred tooth relic, the traditional symbol of royal and religious authority amongst the Sinhalese, to Kandy, and Kandy entered a long period of attritionary warfare with the Portuguese, starting with the campaign of Dantur. Topic: <laughs> Consolidation and interactions with the Dutch, 1594 to 1739. Hostilities between the Portuguese and the Candians continued throughout the rest of Wimaladharmasuriya's reign. The Candians lent aid to a rebellion led by Domingos Correa and later Simão Correa, Sinhala subjects of Dharmapala, between 1594 and 1596. A Portuguese incursion in 1604 saw them capture Balan, but dissent amongst their Lascaran troops forced a withdrawal back to the coast. Relations between the Dutch Republic and the Candians were initiated on 2 June 1602 when Dutch explorer Joris van Spilbergen arrived at Santhamaruthu on the eastern coast of Sri Lanka. Later that year the Dutch East India Company dispatched Sebald de Weert to Kandy in an attempt to negotiate a treaty. The visit ended in disaster when the visitors offended their Candian hosts with their behaviour and in the ensuing fracas de Weert and a several of his entourage were killed. Wimaladharmasuriya died in 1604. The throne passed to his cousin, Senaret, who at the time of the king's death was an ordained priest, but left the Sangha and married Dona Katharina. In 1611 Portuguese forces captured Kandy in the name of the pretender Mayadun of Uva and torched the city yet again. In 1619, Kankili II was deposed and the Jaffna kingdom absorbed into the Portuguese empire. Despite these setbacks Senaret survived as king and in 1612 had even concluded a treaty with the VOC. When help came it was in the form of a Danish East India Company fleet which arrived in 1620, but failed to secure Trincomalee and was expelled by the Portuguese. The Portuguese strengthened their position throughout the 1620s, building forts at Kalutara, Trincomalee, Batikaloa, and in Sabaragamua, and upgrading fortifications in Colombo, Gale, and Manakatawara. A disastrous defeat at the Battle of Randenuela on 2 August 1630 in which Portuguese captain-general Constantino de Sá de Norona was killed resulted in large parts of Portuguese Silao being overrun by the Candians. Internal instability yet again prevented the Candians from securing their acquisitions, and by the time of Senarat's death in 1635 lowland Sri Lanka was once again under Portuguese control. The throne now passed to Senarat's son Rajasinha II, who led the Candians to a major victory over the Portuguese at Ganorua on 28 March 1638. The battle was to be the last major military victory for the Kingdom of Kandy, and succeeded in severely weakening the Portuguese presence in Sri Lanka. In May of that year he concluded a wide-ranging alliance with the Dutch, who were by now in control of Batavia. Batikaloa and Trincomalee fell in 1639, Gale in 1640, and Candian forces seized Portuguese territories further inland. Relations between the Dutch and the Candians had been difficult from the onset and the alliance fell apart in the 1640s. The two sides joined forces again in the 1650s to expel the Portuguese, but a final break occurred in 1656 in the aftermath of the fall of Colombo after a six-month siege and the final expulsion of the Portuguese from Sri Lanka. Rajasinha demanded that the fort be handed over to the Candians for demolition. In November, the Dutch refused and drove the king and his army from the vicinity. 
Rajasinha's hold over his own population was tenuous, and rebellions against him in 1664 and 1671 gave the Dutch the opportunity to seize large parts of Sabaragamua in 1665, as well as Kalpitiya, Katiar, Batakaloa and Trincomalee. The seizure of the ports was a serious blow to the Candian kingdom, not only were Dutch holdings now more or less coterminous with the territory the Portuguese had held, but all Candian trade was now in Dutch hands. Rajasinha attempted to negotiate an alliance with French, who seized Trincomalee, but were expelled by the Dutch in 1672. Candian campaigns in 1675 and 1684 recaptured some territory, but by the time of Rajasinha's death in 1687, neither city had returned to Candian control. Rajasinha's son ascended to the throne as Vimaladharmasuriya II, and his 20 year reign proved relatively peaceable. A trade war broke out in 1701, when the Candians closed their borders with Dutch territories in order to stimulate trade through the ports of Puttalam and Katiar. As a result, the Dutch lost control of the Arika nut trade and retaliated. By 1707, Candian borders had reopened and both ports were closed. Upon his death, Vimaladharmasurya was succeeded by his son, who ruled as Veera Narendra Sinha. Several anti Dutch uprisings occurred in the lowlands during the course of the 1720s and 1730s. The Candians in turn declared war in the Dutch in 1736 and seized some territory. Hostilities subsided with the appointment of Gustaf Willem van Imhoff as governor, and by 1737 the Dutch and Candians were once again at peace. The Nayakers and the coming of the British, 1739–1803 A succession crisis emerged upon Narendrasena's death in 1739. The king had one son, Unambuv Bandera, by a Sinhala consort. However, succession to the Kandian throne was reserved exclusively for those of Kshatriya ancestry on both their mother and father's side, and Unambuve's mother had been of a lower caste. With the support of the Bhikkhu Weliwita Sarankara, the crown passed to the brother of one of Narendrasena's senior wives, a member of the Telugu-speaking and Tamil-speaking Nayak house from southern India. He was crowned Sri Vijaya Rajasinha later that year. Relations between the Sinhala populace, including the Kandian aristocracy, and the Nayakars remained fraught throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries. As early as Narendrasena's reign, attempts at appointing Nayakars to prominent positions in court had caused rebellion, including one in 1732 that the king had only been able to crush with Dutch assistance. The Nayakar nobility, which tended to be exclusivist and monopolize access to the king, was seen as forming an elite group privileged above the native aristocracy, the powerful Adigars. Though Sri Vijaya Rajasena's reign (1739–1747) proved relatively peaceful, his successor Kurdi Sri Rajasinha had to deal with two major rebellions. The first, in 1749, was directed at his father Narayanapa. The second, in 1760, was a far more dangerous insurrection which attempted to replace him with a Siamese prince. Despite these tensions, however, the Nayakar dynasty endured, establishing support by their patronage of Buddhism and Kandian culture. Throughout the reigns of Sri Vijaya Rajasinha and Kurdi Sri Rajasinha the Kandians launched numerous raids and incursions into Dutch territory, including the annexation of villages in 1741, 1743, and 1745. The Dutch governors, subservient to Batavia, were under strict orders to avoid conflict with the kingdom, without ceding any of their privileges, including monopoly of the cinnamon trade. In 1761, however, Kurdi Sri Rajasinha launched a major invasion of the Low Country, annexing Matara and Hanwella as well as numerous frontier districts. It was to prove to be a disaster. The Dutch recaptured Matara and Hanwella in 1762, seized Puttalam and Chala in 1763, and then drove inland in a two pronged invasion. The Kandians evacuated Senkatagala, which the Dutch torched. Outlying agricultural lands were also ravaged, leaving the kingdom on the brink of starvation by 1764. Kurdi Sri Rajasinha requested assistance from the British in 1762, but failed to secure an alliance. By 1765, the Dutch were in a position to force a treaty upon the Kandians, returning not only the border districts but all of Kandy's coastal provinces to the Dutch. Henceforth, the kingdom would be effectively cut off from the outside world. Relations between the Dutch and the Kandians remained peaceable after this until the final expulsion of the former from the island in 1796. 
Though several British sailors and priests had landed in Sri Lanka as early as the 1590s, the most famous was Robert Knox who published an historical relation of the island Ceylon based on his experiences during the reign of Rajasinghe II in 1681. One hundred years later, British involvement in Sri Lankan affairs commenced in earnest with the seizure of Trincomalee by Admiral Edward Hughes as part of general British-Dutch hostilities during the American War of Independence. The tumult of the French Revolution had spread to the Netherlands by 1795, and Dutch Zeeland sided with the Batavian Republic during the ensuing conflict. The British rapidly annexed Dutch possessions in Sri Lanka, taking Trincomalee, which had been returned to the Dutch in 1794 between 28 and the 31st of August, Batikaloa on the 18th of September, and the entirety of Jaffna on the 28th of September. Migasten Disawa, the Kandian ambassador, negotiated a treaty in Madras securing the return of much of the eastern coast to the Kandians in February 1796. By the 15 of that month, Colombo had fallen and Dutch rule on the island had come to an end. Kurdi Sri Rajasinha died in the midst of these events in January 1796, and was succeeded by his brother Sri Rajadi Rajasinha. The new king rejected the terms of Migaston's treaty, depriving the kingdom of the opportunity to regain the lands it had lost a generation earlier. It proved to be a fateful decision. The British immediately set about organizing their new acquisitions, establishing systems of government, education, and justice. With the appointment of Frederick North (1798–1805) as the first British governor of Ceylon, any hope of the Kandians regaining their eastern territories essentially disappeared. Sri Rajadi Rajasinha died of illness on 26 July 1798 with no heir. The English East India Company and the Crown both had control over the island from 1798 until it became the British Crown Colony of Ceylon in 1802. Much of the king's reign had been dominated by the powerful first minister, Pilima Talawe, who now moved to enthroned a young relative of the king, 18-year-old Kanasami as Sri Vikrama Rajasinha. Madhusami, brother-in-law of Sri Rajadi Rajasinha also claimed the throne of Kandy, but Pilima Talav arrested him and his sisters. The first minister, was close to the British however could not control Sri Vikrama Rajasinha, he coveted the throne for himself, and at meetings with the British at Avisawela between 1799 and 1801 requested British assistance in deposing Sri Vikrama Rajasinha. Complex negotiations ensued, with various ideas, including the king being moved to British lands with Pilima Talawe acting as his viceroy in Kandy, were discussed and rejected by both sides. The territories still possessed by the Dutch on the island were formally ceded to the British in the 1802 Treaty of Amiens, but the English company still retained a monopoly on the colony's trade. Agents of the British were put in charge of lucrative pearl fisheries, cotton plantations, salt, and tobacco monopolies. In the first three years the government received £396,000 from pearl fisheries. This compensated for the lower price of cinnamon because of Dutch stocks in Amsterdam. Amidst rising tension, matters came to a head when a group of Moorish British subjects were detained and beaten by agents of Pilima Talawis. British demands for reparations were ignored by the Candians and so North ordered a British force to invade Candian lands starting the First Candian War. On 31 January 1803 a British force led by General Hay McDowell marched to Kandy and found it evacuated. The British force installed Mudusami, but he was not respected by the Kandians. The British were surrounded by hostile people, lacked food, and suffered disease. McDowell became ill and put Major Davy in charge. The British abandoned Kandy with the sick left behind were put to death. Kandian forces defeated the retreating British at the Mahavali River, executing Mutusami and all the British prisoners except Davy and three others. This Kandian War lasted for two years, becoming the longest and most intensive period of the Kandian Wars, because Governor North continued to send forces to the frontiers. <laughs> Annexation and Rebellion, 1803–1817 The British fought their way to Kandy, encountering Kandian resistance led in part by a Malay commander known as Sanginglo. Upon their arrival they found the city deserted. Rather than torching it, they installed a puppet king, Mutusami, and left a small garrison in the town before withdrawing. The Kandians recaptured the city, leaving only one survivor, and harried British forces down to the Mahaveli River, but were routed at Hanwella. 
The following year another British incursion resulted in stalemate, and an uneasy truce was in place by 1805. In the following decade Sri Wikrama Rajasena's increasingly erratic and capricious rule led to serious unrest amongst the population. A major rebellion in the Seven Keralas nearly dethroned him in 1808. The powerful Pilima Talawe rebelled in 1810, was captured, and executed. In 1814, the king ordered Ihelapola Adagar, Dasava of Sabaragamuwa, to Kandy. Ihelapola, suspecting a trap, refused. In revenge, the king had his wife and three children executed. Such was the cruelty of the execution that the Kandian populace, not unused to sites of public execution, now turned en masse against the king. The king was also hugely unpopular amongst the clergy for his sudden and brutal seizures of their land and valuables. In November 1814, ten British subjects were captured and mutilated in Kandian territory. Governor Robert Brownrigg ordered several British forces moved inland from their coastal strongholds in January 1815, accompanied by native forces under Ihelapola. Malagoda, Ihelapola's successor in Sabaragamuwa and Dasava of the Four Keralas, defected to the British in February, Kandy was seized on 14 February, and Sri Wikrama Rajasinghe himself captured on 18 February by Ihelapola's men. The king was subsequently exiled to India, where he died in 1832. His son died childless in 1843, bringing the Nayakar line to an end. On 2 March 1815, British agents, including Robert Brownrigg and John Doyley, met with the nobility of the kingdom and concluded in a conference known as the Kandian Convention. The resulting agreement allowed for the protection of Buddhism and the preservation of local systems of government under the authority of the British governor in Colombo and supervised by British agents in Sabaragamuwa, the Three Keralas, and Uva. In practice, however, local chiefs such as Ihelapola and Malagoda were acutely aware that they were ultimately answerable to the British, and were in practice junior to British military officers who now had free access to their domains. Rebellion broke out in 1817 in Wellasa, spreading rapidly to Uva and Walpane. Kepitapola, disave of Uva, was sent to quash the uprising, but defected and joined the rebels instead. By July, every major Kandian chief except Malagoda had joined the rebellion, several, including Ihelapola, had already been captured. Malagoda however ensured the road to Kandy remained open and on 30 October Kepetapola was captured. His associate Matagalea Dikaram was captured on 1 November, and thereafter the rebellion collapsed. Both leaders were beheaded on 26 November 1817. Viewing the convention as null and void, the British set about breaking the power of the nobility. Though smaller uprisings occurred in 1820, 1823, and 1824, none of them seriously threatened British government of the highlands. The area of the central highlands in which the Kandian kingdom was situated had the natural protection of rivers, waterways, hills and rocky mountainous terrain. The prominent location of the Kandian kingdom with its cool climate had greatly contributed to protect the independence of the nation for nearly three centuries. <laughs> <laughs> Government <laughs> King According to the Kandian administrative system, the king was head of all spheres. He was also known as Lankeshwara Thrissin Haladishwara. It was accepted that the king owned all lands and therefore was known as Bhupati. Even though the king was called Adishwara, he had to rule according to the advice of the Buddhist priests and chieftains. The king had to follow the customs and traditions which were in popular practice at that time, otherwise the people would rebel against him if he did not. Not obeying these would be detrimental to the power of the king, an example being Vikrama Rajasinha, who had to surrender to the British, merely because he ignored the advice of the Buddhist priests and chieftains and did not follow the age old traditions. The kings of Kandy became the rulers of the whole island with Vimaladharmasuri I. <laughs> <laughs> Empire Maha Adhigars Persons were appointed to the title and office by the king, these appointees made up the king's council of ministers. 
Only a very few Adigars existed at one given time and most senior of Adigars was known as the Maha Adikarm or First Adikar, similar to the post of a modern Prime Minister. There was no time limit for the office holder as he held the post at the pleasure of the king, which meant throughout his life, if not incurred the displeasure of the king. It was not hereditary, although members of the same family have been appointed. Dissas Persons were appointed to the title and office by the king, these appointees headed the administration of a large province of the kingdom known as a dasava and was the king's personal representative, tax collector in that area. In modern terms the post was similar to a combination of the post of chief minister and a governor of a province of Sri Lanka. There was no time limit for the officer holder as he held the post at the pleasure of the king, which meant throughout his life, if not incurred the displeasure of the king. It was not hereditary, although members of the same family have been appointed. <laughs> Rate Mahathayas Persons were appointed to the title and office by the king, these appointees headed the administration of a large locality known as Korail, which was a division of the province of the kingdom known as a Dasava and as such he would be subordinate to the local Dasava. There was no time limit for the officer holder as he held the post at the pleasure of the king, which meant throughout his life, if not incurred the displeasure of the king. It was not hereditary, although members of the same family have been appointed. Diawadana Nilama Diawadana Nilama was an office of the royal household, charged with safeguarding and carrying out ancient rituals for the sacred relic of the Tooth of the Buddha. The Diawadana Nilama has the responsibility of overseeing of all aspects of the Sri Dalada Malagawa. One of his principal duty of organizing the annual pageant, the Kandiya Sala Parahara. Basnayaka Nilama Law The Kingdom of Kandy had its own law. Some parts of it have been annexed to the current Sri Lankan law along with common law, Roman Dutch law, and the Savalamai law. The court language of Kandy was under the Nayaks, the Tamil language. Topic: Military. The Kingdom of Kandy did not maintain a large standing army, which was common for the era, although the king maintained a full-time royal guard at the palace. In the provinces, local garrisons were maintained to guard strategic mountain passes or to suppress rebellions. During times of war or military campaign, these would be supplemented with local militia. Kandyan forces, throughout their history, relied heavily on the mountainous terrain of the kingdom and primarily engaged in guerrilla-style hit-and-run attacks, ambushes, and quick raids. One of the hallmarks of the clashes between the kingdom and its European foes was the inability of either side to take and hold land or to permanently cut off supply routes, with the exception being the Dutch, who managed to do so for an extended period of time in 1762. In the 16th and 17th century the Kandyan kings relied on mercenaries, often Telugu military adventurers. With the arrival of the Nayakars, large numbers of South Indian Tamil soldiers made up the king's personal guard. In addition to this, various Europeans were in the king's service during this period including a master gunner, and large contingents of Malays, who were very highly regarded as fighters. As for the armies, each of the local chieftains could call upon a militia which often accompanied them on their journeys around the kingdom. The bulk of the Kandyan army consisted of local peasant conscripts, irregulars pressed into service in times of war, who tended to bring with them around 20 days' worth of supplies and functioned in discrete units often out of contact with each other. One of the reasons for the Kandyans' inability to hold the land they captured was poor logistical support, as many soldiers had to return to base to replenish their supplies once they ran out. Interaction with Europeans had led to the introduction of muskets and other gunpowder weapons, and by the 1760s bows and arrows had been rendered obsolete. Kandyan gunsmiths specialized in manufacturing light flintlocks with smaller bores than European guns, with their barrels extended for accuracy. The Kandyans also developed a unique form of handheld cannon, the Kodithuakua. 
These innovations allowed the kingdom to produce heavy artillery on the scale and quality of European forces. Economy During the reign of Vimaladharmasurya I many steps were taken to develop and improve the economy of the Kingdom of Kandy. He took steps to improve the iron industry the Uva province and agriculture in places such as Kothmail, Wallapane, Harispathuwa, Uva, Hewahita, Udunawara, Yatanawara and Adudumbara. Imports of the Kandyan kingdom included silk, tea, and sugar while exports included cinnamon, pepper and areca nut. Administrative divisions Divisions In the early years of the kingdom it consisted of areas or divisions. Radha Wasama Radha Wasama was the provincial administration of the subdivisions of the Kingdom of Kandy. Demographics Language Religions The state religion was Buddhism. Due to the activities of the Portuguese, ordained Buddhist monks were absent by the Dutch era. After the arrival of the Nayak dynasty Buddhism was again firmly established in the island. The dynasty of Vimaladharmasurya I largely tolerated the presence of Christians, in particular Catholics fleeing Portuguese land following their occupation by the Dutch. On occasion the Kandyan kings even protected Catholic agents, most famously Vimaladharmasurya II's protection of Joseph Vaz. The religious environment, however, changed dramatically with the arrival of the Nayak dynasty. In 1743 Sri Vijaya Rajasinha ordered churches burned and commenced a general repression of the faith, which continued until Kurdi Sri Rajasinha commanded its cessation. <laughs> Culture and arts Art and architecture See also Stranger King Sri Lanka History of Sri Lanka List of Sri Lankan monarchs Campaign of Dancher Castane Kandyan-era frescoes <laughs>